piece of housekeeping. Next week, we go back to two services, 9.30 and 11.15, so 15 minutes later, and we will all try to practice being good with change. So. <laughs> My sermons will be 15 minutes better. <laughs> So over at my house yesterday, Anne and I had one of those conversations that come up nearly every Saturday. <laughs> What's your sermon about this week, she asked me. It's about covenant, I answered. That's a boring topic, she advised. <laughs> We've had this Saturday conversation several hundred times now, and I'm proud that most of the time, she does not think my topics are boring, but she's never afraid to say what she thinks. And unfortunately, she's right. As a minister, though, covenant is a topic that I've returned to time and time again. When I was just starting out, I once preached a sermon about covenant, and fearing that the topic would be boring, I decided to jazz it up by dressing as Indiana Jones. <laughs> as in like the Ark of the Covenant. And I entered the pulpit wearing a fedora and brandishing a whip. <laughs> and I actually gave that sermon over at Eno River UU Fellowship in 2007. And, and I was never invited back. <laughs> is at the core of what we are about as a church. Because it's also about the core of our humanity. As Martin Buber, the Jewish theologian, said, we are the promise-making, promise-keeping, promise-breaking, promise-renewing being. We make promises, we live up to them, or we fail to live up to them, and when we fail, we often try again through grace or redemption to move back into those promises. I'd like to give you a map, a map of where we're going together in my sermon this morning. My sermon contains perhaps three movements. The first movement is deconstruction. I'm going to deconstruct and interrogate and tear apart the idea of covenant. So I just want to let you know that's what I'm going to do. Then the second movement is reconstruction. I'm going to reconstruct, reclaim, and rebuild this notion of covenant. And then finally, in the third movement of the sermon, I'm going to be directive, and I'm going to talk about the types of covenant that we ought to affirm as a congregation, and also about the way we might be more intentional, intentional about the promises that we make in the course of our everyday lives. First movement, deconstruction. Years and years ago, when I was a much younger and wide-eyed minister, I was having a conversation with someone. I was speaking from my perspective as a minister and as a committed and devoted Unitarian Universalist. The person I was speaking to was non-religious. In fact, that's not right. He was anti-religious. In fact, that's not even right. He was what Friedrich Schleiermacher, Schleiermacher famously called a cultured despiser of religion. <laughs> you may know a few cultured despisers of religion. In any event, I was talking about how special Unitarian Universalism is by explaining how we aren't a creedal faith sharing the same belief, but rather how we are a covenantal faith, sharing a common understanding of how we hope to be together in community. We are covenantal. And my conversation partner looked at me in the driest, sneeringest, most contemptuous voice that you can possibly imagine said the following. Covenants. Covenants are what kept African American people from living in Leeward. What he was referring to, of course, were 
neighborhood covenants adopted in neighborhoods all across the country in the last century that prohibited black and brown people from buying homes in certain neighborhoods. Just so we're clear on this, let me read from that covenant that was what he thought about. Quote, and this was the neighborhood he was talking about, ownership or occupancy by any person of Negro blood or by any person more than one-fourth of the Semitic race, blood, origin, or extraction, including without limitation in said designation Armenians, Jews, Hebrews, Turks, Persians, Syrians, and Arabians are prohibited. All around the country. So my point here, my point here in bringing this up is to say this. There is nothing inherently good about covenant. <coughs> there is nothing inherently good about covenant. In fact, covenants can be used, have been used to exclude, to discriminate, to oppress. They can be used to persecute, to harass, to control, to police, to bully, and to marginalize, and to shun. At the most basic level, a covenant is a promise that exists between two or more individuals about how they'll be in relationship with one another. A covenant in this sense is neither good nor bad. We can promise to be together in good and healthy ways that make the world better, and we can promise to be together in unhealthy and destructive ways. When we talk about covenant, though, there is usually the sense that we're not promising ordinary, everyday things. It sounds a little bit odd to covenant to load and unload the dishwasher. <laughs> Although I don't want to make any judgments about what you may do in your home. A covenant is usually entered into around promises that are difficult to live into and keep and uphold. There is a sense that a covenant will involve all parties trying their best to live up to it, inevitably falling short, and then re-entering the covenant despite failing to live up to its demands. Covenant is mostly known to us by way of Judaism and through the legacies of the Abrahamic faiths. The word covenant first appears in the Bible with the story of Noah. After Noah builds the ark, after the flood, when the waters recede, God makes a first covenant with Noah. In fact, that's actually entirely wrong. I didn't read what was on the page. He does not make a covenant with Noah. <laughs> he makes a covenant with the entire world. God promises not to destroy the world again. It's not a covenant with Noah. Noah doesn't have any part in that. Noah doesn't have to promise anything in return. The first covenant is unconditional. It's not, I won't destroy the world as long as you do this and this and this. It's, I won't destroy the world, period. And it's universal. God says in Genesis, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on earth. It's a universal promise. But then, in the book of Genesis and throughout the rest of the Bible, you have a series of additional covenants, the most famous of which are the covenants that are entered into between God and Abraham and God and the descendants of Abraham and down through the lineage. And these covenants are a little different. For one thing, they do require something. There is a give and take. I will do this, and you will do this, and we both have to promise. But more importantly, these latter covenants, these later covenants, are particular. They bind a group. There are people who the covenant includes, and people who the covenant does not include. Covenant is a way of creating a particular community. In some ways, that makes sense. 
When two people get married, for example, they make their wedding vows to each other. Every single other person on earth is excluded from those marriage vows, in a way. If the church choir has a covenant that they share, anyone who doesn't belong to the <coughs> choir is not a party to that covenant. And covenants are often used to create the limits or the boundaries of community. Where am I going with this? This summer I read a really impactful book. It was titled, Conflict is Not Abuse. Interesting title, Conflict is Not Abuse, Overstating Harm, Community Responsibility and the Duty of Repair by a scholar named Sarah Schulman. And what this book is about, what this book is about is how communities can be really, really, really bad at dealing with conflict. And she actually offers some insights about that. She talks about how conflict involves two sides, how conflict involves shades of gray, how conflict involves nuance, and how conflict involves the presence of tension. Then Shulman writes that often, often people, often communities, seem not to possess very much resilience in the face of this conflict, this shades of gray, this nuance, this tension. And she writes about how when conflict cannot be faced, when we don't have the, we don't have the stomach to face it, communities will often respond by treating things as black and white instead of as shades of gray, taking the two people involved in the conflict and labeling one the victim and the other the perpetrator, and by responding to choose, by choosing sides and shunning and scapegoating one party. The stakes of this, depending upon the community, can be either very high or not. In a group of friends, it's often a person who's excluded. At the national level, it can be life and death. And, and Shulman writes how within communities, oftentimes it is our promises that people use to justify the act of shunning or the act of pushing away. There's nothing inherently good or inherently bad about covenants. Covenants can be used as a means of exclusion or as a means of exploring conflict in a healthier way. Covenants can be used to take sides and assign blame, or they can be used to help us become more self-aware. There is nothing inherently good or inherently bad about covenants. Part two, reconstruction. It's the shorter part. <laughs> when I became minister of this church in 2014, one of the things I inherited was not only a congregational covenant, but a congregational culture of being intentional about covenants. I am grateful, truly and deeply grateful to my predecessor and to all of the congregational leaders who worked with her who helped to establish this covenant. We're a congregation that creates covenants. The board has a covenant, the staff has a covenant, the choir has a covenant. In religious education classes, the year often begins with the children or the youth speaking intentionally about how they want to be together. Spiritual exploration and practice groups also are intentional about making promises about how they will be together. And of course, we have the congregational covenant a copy of which should have been included in your order of service. In the first part of this sermon, I said that covenants in and of themselves are neither inherently good nor inherently bad. Now I'm going to say something else. As far as we as humans have a need to be in groups, it will be challenging to be in groups. We have a need to be in groups, it's challenging to be in groups, 
and covenants can help us do better in the groups we choose to be a part of. It's my belief that the covenant we share as a church community is mostly good and serves us well the vast majority of the time. And it's worthwhile, I think, to take a look at that covenant we share. Our congregational covenant is arranged around four themes. Healthy communication, conflict resolution, respect for diversity, and our responsibilities for supporting this congregation. What I'd like to do is point out a number of things that I appreciate about our covenant, as well as a couple areas that I kind of have some questions about. In our congregational covenant, I especially appreciate the emphasis on direct communication, rather than gossip, the emphasis on speaking to the appropriate person, rather, rather than invading broadly when you are feeling conflicted. Our covenant calls for transparency rather than clandestine whispering. Further, I appreciate that when our covenant speaks of diversity in thought, belief, and culture, that it also raises the issue of power differentials and systemic oppression. It calls on us to be especially sensitive to the contributions and needs of those who have been historically marginalized. And finally, I appreciate that our covenant names our responsibility for co-creating beloved community. It calls us to a stewardship of the church, a stewardship of our church. I'd also like to point out a couple of things that I have questions about. I do wonder what it would look like if there was a little bit more reflexivity about how we engage with conflict. One of our other church procedures recommends that the first step to engaging conflict is to engage in a time of self-reflection. That's not just for church. I think that's actually a good habit in life, that when we experience conflict, the first step is to engage a time of self-reflection. Quote, it can be careful, it can be helpful to become curious about conflict rather than upset. So ask yourself the following questions. Why is this matter important to me? What needs do I have that are not being met? And I would add an additional question that Sarah Schulman invites us to ask ourselves when we're faced with conflict. What role, if any, have I played in contributing to this conflict? invited to greater reflexivity, and greater self-awareness. Another thing that I think about that might be missing from our covenant is the idea that a healthy community will always include tensions. In fact, if we sought to eradicate tensions, it would be destructive, and it would probably fail. Some tensions are a matter of personal preference. Some people in our church might prefer bluegrass. Others might not care for bluegrass. And that's okay. I know that's heresy to say. <laughs> Some people might like traditional Protestant hymns with four verses and a key change before the last verse. And other people might prefer newer hymns with complex rhythms and tambourine. Some people might not like a particular theological word, but the word you dislike may be the exact word that the person sitting next to you in the pew needs so badly to hear. And so one of the things that we actually admit to, kind of when we join community, is that there's all sorts of tensions things that I like and things that I don't like and I don't always get my way. Some tensions, however, are not simply about matters of personal preference. My colleague, Jordan Nelson Long, my friend who was in the pulpit two weeks ago, she posted uh, something today, or actually something earlier this week, that I thought was really interesting, speaking about attention in her own congregation. She writes, 
when I engage with people recently, I need to figure out where they're coming from. For some people I talk with, the greatest challenge of our day is how to better make space for all voices. And other people I talk to, the greatest challenge of the day is, quote, how we can effectively counter the heck, she uses a different word, counter the heck out of fascism. And those two questions are not the same question. They may not even be compatible. But I am committed to being in a church with this tension. So I think that one of the things that our covenant might lift up is not just that some tensions are easy to resolve by saying, I'm sorry, by saying, I didn't understand or I'll try to do better. And some tensions are just there, the reality of being part of a group. And Sarah Schulman would say that when we try to remove that tension, that we actually do more harm good. As Martin Luther said, we are the promise-making, promise-keeping, promise-breaking, promise-renewing people. I invite you, as you said about this week, not just to read the Church Covenant, but I invite you to pay attention to the promises that you make. Not just the promises you say, the promises you make in the depth of your being, the promises you make in your mind, the commitments that you make. Be attentive to them. Be attentive to the commitments that you make lightly, as well as the commitments you make from the depth of your being. And with that awareness, with that awareness, go forth. And with that awareness, see how it is for you in your heart. We're going to end with a closing hymn. The first hymn this morning was one with some jazzy, complicated rhythm. The closing hymn is one of those Protestant hymns. <laughs> Both of you. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit and join in singing number 126, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.